Height Center for the 30th Annual St. Lucie County Science and Engineering for STEM competition. At St. Lucie County, we invite all the public school students, private school, home school, and charter school students to attend. We have a middle school competition on the first floor and a uh, high school senior competition on the second floor. My project is on the viscosity of household liquids. The question was, how does temperature affect the viscosity of liquids? I hypothesize that water would be the most unaffected from the three different temperatures, which were room temperature, 40 degrees Celsius, and 60 degrees Celsius. Water was, in fact, the least affected from the temperature changed. Molasses was the most affected. Um, I used water, olive oil, corn syrup, and molasses. And I noticed that in the 60 degrees Celsius that corn syrup decided it was going to clump up instead of become faster rate. My hypothesis was proven correct from the results that I got. My name is Ethan Hyde. I'm from St. Lucie, West K-8. My, my um, project title was Stormwater, and my problem was how does crushed shell affect the level of heavy metals in stormwater runoff? My hypothesis was if stormwater runoff contains heavy metals, then filtering it through a crushed shell substrate will decrease the level of heavy metals. My conclusion was that the heavy metals, I mean the crushed shells actually um, decreased the heavy metal level in the water, so it worked. And <laughs> Hi, my name is Trevor Gill. I go to Mosaic Digital Academy. My project is decellularizing spinach. Recently, artificial organs have become a large topic in the scientific community and a lot of older people who maybe need a new heart or have heart problems can get a transplant. Now the problem with this is that the cells in the heart might be rejected by the host. So my project is showing what soaps and deter detergents are best to decellularize the spinach leaves, which is like the model for the heart, because the veins in that of a spinach leaf closely resemble those in that of a human heart or a small animal like a rat or a rodent. So they, like scientists have recently actually turned a spinach leaf into a living beating heart. So I took three different types of soaps, uh, ivory, dawn, and biodegradable, and soaked spinach leaves in them with water as my control, then created a color scale from one to five, with five being completely clear, because the clearer the leaf, it means all the cells are gone, and one being all green. And by, by just a teeny bit ivory beat out dawn, my hypothesis was dawn, um, then uh, the ivory did the best that you can see right here. So my hypothesis was incorrect. Um, and I found this article on nationalgeographic.com and other sources that I have right here. My name is Kaylee Hernandez and I go to Alapada Flats. So my project is about matchstick rockets. We were in science class one day and the teacher searched up a bunch of videos about rockets and it sounded very interesting. So I decided, hey, I want to do my science fair project on rockets. I researched at home a bunch of different rockets that I could use and I think figured out that matchstick could look like a possibility. So I researched even more to figure out the proper design and I did several trials and experiments and then I figured out that the small rocket was able to go farther than the other rockets. First, I took a skewer and a, and a match head and I wrapped it in aluminum foil. Second, I, I adjusted the, the tip of the foil so it could look kind of like a rocket. Third, I got a matchbox and I hole punch a hole there and taped it so it could be the same angle. Fifth, I 
took the skewer out of the match that he made and then he touched the match on the matchbox. Six, I ignited it and then calculated the distance. So I was checking my data and I figured out the small one went the fastest, far, farthest. And, but it didn't go as far as I expected to because out of all the nine rockets I tested, only two of them actually launched. But one of them actually caught on fire. And then I figured out that it did support my hypothesis because my hypothesis stated that it was the small rocket goes the farthest and the small rocket went 28 inches. Hello, my name is William Nelson. I'm a freshman at Lincoln Park Academy. My project is Acne Be Gone. Me being a teenager in high school and a lot of my friends, obviously acne is a common thing in high schoolers. So I wanted to see, I wanted to put to the test which acne medication works the best. I used the proactive treatment XL and the Neutrogena treatment Rapid Clear. The XL is a benzoyl peroxide base and it more kills bacteria and the and the Neutrogena treatment is a salicylic acid base and it only retards the bacteria. So I hypothesized that the XL would be the better medication. And it turns out that the data showed that the XL worked the best. I had to do I had to do the procedure at the lab at the lab at IRSC because I use a bacteria called Staphylococcus aureus, which is very dangerous. So I had to go in a protected environment. I found that the benzoyl peroxide beat the salicylic acid by much because it just kills the it kills the bacteria altogether instead of just instead of just slowing it down. Here you can see my different test groups. I spread here you can see that I was spreading the bacteria onto the onto the plate and I dip I dip sterilized paper disc into the medication and place them into the disc and I measured how much of the incubation halo grew and whichever one had the biggest halo would tell me which one worked the best. And as I said, it ended up being the XL. So I, it was a really fun experience because I've always wanted to work in a lab and I'm interested in science and medicine so it was a very fun experience for me being able to work in that environment and to help me learn which medication is the best. Hi, my name is Andrew Johnson. I am a sophomore at Fort Pierce Central High School, and this is my project, Linear Canon Part 2. Now, it is Linear Canon Part 2 because this is a continuation off of a project that I did two years ago previously, in which I took or measured the amount of ball bearings and how they affect the propulsion of the end result. So, in, which, in this experiment, the first experiment, I placed different amounts of ball bearings at the end of this rail right here. So through this picture, we can see that the magnet is held underneath the zip tie, and there is an initial ball bearing. You put a eraser's length of space between the first ball bearing, and once you pull it, a force of the magnet pulls the first one, projecting it outwards. Now, two small amount of ball bearings at the beginning, it will the magnetic force will pull it backwards, and too much there won't be enough force generated. Now, the in-between we found was about five ball bearings in which it wasn't affected by the magnetic force or fizzled out all the way through. So for this experiment, we decided to measure how different size magnets actually affect the propulsion. So our magnets range from a size of half an inch in diameter all the way down to three millimeters, about this size. We found that the larger magnets actually had too large of a magnetic force in which the ball bearings would collapse in on itself and there would be no propulsion created. Now the smaller magnets, though they were stronger in power, they actually didn't have a magnetic field strong enough or big enough to pull the, back, the, mag or the ball bearing forward. We did find that the magnets with the most similar diameter to the ball bearing created the most force and propelled the ball bearings the farthest. This was about five millimeters, which was the di diameter of the ball again, and that the, most, the more similar the size of your magnet, the farther it's going to project the ball bearing. I'm Blair Hines, and um, I did the dry ice balloon. And my question was, how does different measurements of dry ice affect the inflation of balloon? My hypothesis was that the more chunks of dry ice there is in each bottle, the bigger the balloon will inflate. And my results were right. The bigger, um, the more chunks I put in the bottles, the more the balloon inflated.
and materials I had balloons, empty plastic bottles, gloves and tongs, and dry ice. My conclusion was that the more chunks of dry ice you put in the bottle, the bigger the balloon, balloon will inflate. Dry ice is a solid form of carbon dioxide. Therefore, when you blow up a balloon with dry ice, you are filling it with carbon dioxide. So as a dry ice sublimates or turns into gas, it takes up a lot of a lot of space eventually to where the whole blows the whole balloon. My name is Philip Marco, and I am going to Palm Point. I am in sixth grade, and uh, my science fair project was creating a habit in fish. My project was inspired by Pavlov and his dogs. He created a habit in his dogs by ringing a bell that the dogs would salivate because after he would ring the bell, he would feed the dogs and the dogs would learn to remember food when they hear the bell. I, tr I recreate, recreated this with fish. I tapped my fish tank three times before I fed them each day and to see if the fish would learn to um, cre create a habit when the tapping on the tank um, when the tapping on the tank um, makes them think of food, so they'd come to the top of the tank to eat. And my hypothesis was that they would. They did only two out of the three fish came to the top of the tank uh, at a day's period, and my project was over a seven-day period. My name is Alejandro Cano. My school is Samuel Games Academy, and well, my project was like. How, how temperature affects the gas molecules in a balloon. So what I did, I put it in, a, in the room temperature and I put it in cold and then I put it on my data table. And my data table proved that, that it got smaller, which has my hypothesis. And, and I was right on my conclusion. I said, and it proved that I was right about a circumference getting smaller. Um, I'm Miles Biglin, and my pro I go to Lincoln Park Academy. Um, my project is about Yetis and Ozarks and which ones work the best. So what we did was we would take boiling water, and we'd pour them into each three cups to see and measure um, every 30 minutes for three hours which cup works the best. And in result, the Ozark turned out to be better by only 1.8 degrees. So when you're buying the cups, um, a Yeti is $40 and an Ozark is $9, so you're saving $30 to buy a cup that is much better by only a few degrees, and it can still save you a lot of money. And the Tervis is just a control and a little thing to compare to the stats that we have for the Ozark and the Yeti. Well, so this is the Ozark Trail that we cut in half. Um, it has, it's a vacuum flask, and it was invented by James Duar in 1892, and it's pretty much like space, it's a vacuum, there's nothing in there, and there's no air, but because that it's not space, there's only a little bit, so it keeps your drinks the hottest and coldest for a long amount of time that you want. Hello, my name is Tristan Day, I am from Treasure Coast High School, I'm a senior. Uh, our presentation here, uh, we are in the robotics team, and we built a robot that was made to do a rec relic recovery thing. In the relic recovery, there's a little doll, kind of like a little totem, that we have to get and put over this edge. We decided to go in depth about that to see how far you need to get to get these points, because the first block's like one point, two point, three points, and it doubles like that if you get them to stand up. So we decided to see how our robot would be able to get precisely enough to get to this point. So, we decided to take the relic, decided to measure it out, find the center of mass, the weight and all that stuff, because it's plastic, so had to make sure we got everything precise so it didn't bounce out or anything like that. Afterwards, we had to take our claw, got to take the motor and all that stuff to make sure that A, we need to be able to throw it far enough to get to the three points, and B, to make it to where it goes high enough to where we could try to make it land, but also not to get it bounce out, so we had to watch all of that. So we also had to go for time because with this, during the cycle we have about five to ten seconds and that also counts grabbing and all that stuff. So we also had to make sure so that speed could throw it fast enough and also get us back in time. So all, with all this, we had to make sure that the relic, while being thrown, 
would also stand up. So we took the angles we'd have to find to get it to release, and we'd also have to take the velocity which we needed to make it travel. So we made a few calculations to get it to where we found the momentum of our swing, or motor, and eventually got it to where if we release it at 120, we can get it to go 1.011 meters per second and get it to land on its upright about 60% of the time. Uh, my name is Alexander Palazzolo. Um, I'm homeschooled and my science fair project is on the effects of weight distribution on paper airplanes. Now I've always been interested in uh, aeronautics and things like that so I'm reading this article on this cargo jet whose uh, who's cargo all slid to the back and all that weight has shifted during takeoff and had just installed and crashed. So I decided I can apply that principle to paper airplanes. So I have uh, three paper airplanes and this one has uh, weight in the front and I have one with the weight in the back and in the middle. So I launched it from the slingshot and my hypothesis was, just like that cargo jet, that the, um, the plane with the weight in the back would stall and crash. So my hypothesis is proven correct. So. I'm looking for what was their interest in even wanting to do this particular project? What was their uh, background interest as well as forward thinking? So in the future, how is this going to impact your future and, and beyond? So for example, a young lady today was telling me about how she wants to be a medical engineer and her project dealt with um, creating a new machine for those to use for their pancreas to release blood sugars and things of that nature. So again, what was the interest and how is this going to impact the future? My role as the special awards coordinator, I get to work with the judges once they're completed their first round of scoring students and um, finding out who's going to be that first, second, and third place in that particular category. Then what we do is there's a round two, and the round two are actually special awards that are given to students that go um, just above and beyond and just really stand out for these special awards. And when we talk about special awards, what those are are actually sponsored by community partners. It might be um, the Oceanographic Institute, it might be Smithsonian, um, the UF Extension, several um, there's just multiple awards that are being provided for these students um, they could be monetary they could be um, just a, uh, a plaque there are several different ways that um, they provide these awards for the students so when they see the special award judges coming around they know that there's something extra special about their project so when we get a chance to see what these kids are doing it's it's just amazing about what they have researched, what they've uh, discovered, and their chance to make a difference in our community and maybe even around the world. So um, getting a chance to see these kids go to the next level at state level and then possibly even to international um, is really exciting for us. So these special awards help make those um, possible. So. I'm from Lincoln Park Academy and for my science fair project I did a project called fabric softener fire and I tested if treating clothes with fabric softener would increase the flammability so I washed three by four inch pieces of 100% cotton fabric three of them were washed with fabric softener three were not I burned them until all the original color was gone from the fabric and timed each piece of fabric. My hypothesis was that if the fabric was washed with fabric softener, then it would burn faster than fabric that was not washed with fabric softener. My data shows that the fabric softener did increase the flammability and it burned much faster 
than the fabric that wasn't burned with the fabric softener. And my conclusion was that after doing the research and performing the experiment, that the fabric softener did increase the flammability. My name is Drew Gill. My name is Jackson Chisholm. And we go to Lincoln Park Academy. Our project is filter this, and we're trying to find the most effective method of filtration. We have filter A, which is a jug filter that starts with sand, then charcoal, then pea gravel, and then grass. And you pour the water in, and it trickles through and filters it. Okay, my filter is filter B, and what you need is two glass bottles, a ch two metal trays, sand, and a rag. The sand, you pour the sand in the tray, and the sand is to keep the heat to the bottle, so it <laughs> heats it up faster and keeps the heat. And then the other bottle is for the rag has to be on top, and it's going to be wet, so when it, the steam goes over, it cools down into a liquid. We chose our project because there's people in third world countries that don't have water, and we thought if they know how to filter their dirty water better, they can help get water. Hi, I'm Madison Duarte Osip, and I go to Southern Oaks Middle School, and my project is the freeze test. I wanted to know which liquid would freeze the fastest, and my reason was because I would make ice pops or lemon pops, and I wanted to know exactly how long it would take. So the four things I did was Coke, tea, lemonade, and water. My hypothesis was that water would freeze the fastest because it is a natural substance and has no real ingredients or sugar like the other substances. And here is the four trays that I used, which, and then I had four cubics of each liquid. And I would check in about every hour or 45 minutes and then half an hour. And I averaged the times when I was done, and it took about 76 minutes for water, 145 minutes for lemonade, Coke was 301 minutes, and sweet tea was 248 minutes. And I think the Coke and the sweet tea took longer because they had more sugar than the water and the lemonade. But I don't know for sure, that's just my um, theory. And my variables was, my independent variable was the type of liquids, the dependent variable was how long it takes for the Coke, lemonade, tea, water, and water to freeze. And then my control variable was the temperature of the freezer, the amount of liquid in each cube, and the type of trays I used, and the temperature of the liquids. And it's important for people to know about this experiment because anyone else wants to make like flavored ice cubes or just regular ice cubes, they would have a average time of how long it would take and they wouldn't just have to wait around, they could just know right away. And my conclusion is that I did learn that water did freeze the fastest, so my hypothesis was correct. And that these other substances could have taken longer because of sugar, because of the sh amount of sugar in them. And then my materials were the Coke, the water, the lemonade, the sweet tea, the four ice trays, the freezer, and a stopwatch, and a measuring cup, and a turkey bastard. I measured how much was actually in each cube, and there's about like 45 milliliters in each cube. And we let all the liquids after they were in the fridge like settle for to become room temperature, and then we put them all in there. So I, my name is Reina Vitas, and I go to Manti Academy, and my project is Shine On, and it's about what liquid produces oxidation off of pennies of the same year of 1980 and how they affect it over the course of 24, 48, and 72 hours. And then I used the four liquids, Red Bull, Coca-Cola, vinegar, and lemon juice. And I was predicting that Coca-Cola would remove the most oxidation due to the high amounts in sugar but that was proven correct on two out of the three trials. So I took um, four cups and I placed liquid into them, uh, two tablespoons, and I placed each one in and I checked and documented the 24 hour mark, we placed it back in the liquid, put it back in for the 72 hour mark, and then did it for the 48 hour mark and then 72 hour mark, and calculated my results to see which one removed the most oxidation. Which one did? Coke. 
Coca-Cola on two out of three. So my hypothesis was like semi-proven until I got two out of the three. What made you decide to use 1980 tennis? Because they've been around long enough and they have like have like oxidation on and like it would be like more accurate than like a penny from like 2010 because those haven't like had much much oxidation on it so they would like be like a better experiment penny to use because like there's dirt on it. My name is Shreya Reddy. I'm from Lincoln Park Academy and my project is the cytotoxic effects of solondac metformin and TBHP on lung cancer cells and the effects of a low glucose level on the efficiency of the treatment. So lung cancer accounts for 27% of all cancer deaths in the United States. For distant tumors, the five-year survival rate is only 4%. Solondac is a drug which has already been approved by the FDA for human use to treat any type of inflammatory pain, such as arthritis. Metformin is a drug which is also approved for use to treat anti-diabetes, for treat diabetes. Terbutyl peroxide, which is commonly known as TBHP, is a drug which causes oxidative stress, which leads to cell death. So I actually had done previous research and found that Solendac had actually been used to treat colon polyps for certain carcinomas, and treatments, people who were on the metformin treatment actually had lower incidence of cancer. So I wanted to determine if the combination of Solendac, metformin, and TBHP would have a cytotoxic effect on the A549 lung cancer cell line. <laughs> uh, when I first started volunteering at FAU, I noticed that they actually, it was common laboratory practice for them to treat and grow cells in a, a medium where the glucose level was higher than the normal glucose level in humans. So I wanted to know if a low glucose level would have an effect on the efficiency of the treatment. So to start my experiment, I first um, grew the cell line in a well plate at a low glucose level and a well plate at a high glucose level. I then uh, treated each well plate with four treatments. A control, 500 micromolars of Solendac, 2 millimolars of metformin, and a combination of Solendac plus metformin. I found that the combination actually caused significantly more cell death than the individual drugs alone. And it showed that, sorry, and as shown by my ANOVAs, and the combination treatment actually had almost 100% cell death at the lowest TBHP treatment. It also showed that the low glucose level caused significantly more efficient of a treatment. So at a low glucose treatment, the, cell, the treatment caused 10 times more cell death than in a high glucose. And this response is very interesting because this is the first time these drugs have ever been used to treat cancer. And it's really revolutionary because these drugs are already out there and they're approved by the FDA for use to treat any type of um, disease. So uh, it cuts the lengthy process, so it usually takes 10 to 15 years of putting the drugs on the market. So it's non-toxic, so there's no need for clinical trials, and they, it's a, a lot less expensive than typical treatments for lung cancer. My name's Andrea. I'm Samantha. We go to MOA, we go to Westwood High School. Um, we did a project on electrolytes to see which liquid had the most electrolytes because when people exercise, they lose a lot of electrolytes um, due to sweating and stuff like that. And we tried to figure out which liquid we, would be best to replenish these electrolytes. And we tested water, orange juice, Gatorade, and Powerade. We thought that Gatorade would have the most amount of electrolytes because we always see athletes drinking it and it's advertised a lot, but we were wrong and it was actually orange juice. Yeah, distilled water had the least amount of electrolytes. Um, I think Powerade came up second to orange juice and then uh, Gatorade was like... Gatorade was third. Yeah. We used a... Uh, what's it called? Multimeter to basically a multimeter connected to wires that were connected to a two copper wires that were like wrapped around a straw, like a piece of straw, and you put it in the water at the same or in the liquid at the same like depth, and it like measures the current, and you have to like convert it into amps and stuff. And the one that has the most has the most electrolytes in it. Okay, I am Dominic Stewart. I go to Southern Oaks Middle School. And this is my science fair project. 
It's about which flavor of ice cream will melt faster. Down here is my proceed procedures. This is my variables. This is the um, data graph, the pictures, the conclusion, the applications. I have my variables right here, my materials, my hypothesis, my purpose, why I did this project, my report, how my project went, my books and resources, my links to my um, resources that I got them from, and my title. I found out that vanilla melted faster. And I don't know really why it just melted faster. I used it. I used this brand right here, Hagen Dines, I think. Um, yeah, that's really it. My name is Ariana Rivera, and I go to Palm Point. And my project is named a Gerbils GPS, and it's about how a Gerbils sets a smell and navigational skills helps it navigate through a maze. And during my project, I was seeing which intervals of measurement was were able to help the gerbil get to the maze the fastest. So I did a baseline, which was only at the finish line. And then I did uh, intervals of 12 inches, 24 inches, and 36. And I also had different results for each one because it was least, least successful in some of them. And the least successful one was the baseline because it was only food at the finish and didn't have a very good guideline. And my hypothesis was that a gerbil would be more successful with, the, with intervals of 12 inches apart and my hypothesis was correct. My name is Elizabeth Briglia and I go to Mosaic Digital Academy. Uh, and my project is about fingerprinting uh, and what surfaces uh, lift the fingerprints the best. And my hypothesis was that glass or metal, which are non-porous like objects or uh, and would pick them, the fingerprints up, off up the best, and porous uh, surfaces like concrete or wood would pick them up worse. And I did the test three times, and by touching all the um, surfaces I was using, which is metal, glass, wood, concrete, paper, and plastic. I did the. I did it three times to test which ones were, like, picked it up the best. Uh, and the metal picked it up the best because it's non-porous, and glass picked it up the second best. And I thought that paper was going to be the worst, but it was actually the third best. And wood was the fourth, and plastic was the fifth, and concrete was the sixth. Uh, I have the best ones from each one I tested on the board for it, and I got the things I needed for fingerprinting from the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office. So, Could you introduce us to some of the equipment that you used? Um, this is latent fingerprint powder that you used you use this brush, I forgot what it's called, and you uh, dip it in and then you dust it off by spinning it and it, you uh, spin it over the fingerprint that you put down to so it can like attach to like the oils that are on your skin, like left behind. And then I use this one and a half inch clear tape to pick it up and I use the, these cards to put the tape after I picked up the prints on the back of it, like how I have displayed on my board. Okay, thank you. Welcome. I'm Antonio Della Torre from Southport Middle School, and my my project is if sun or wind energy, and which one was better. So what I did was I used a solar panel and a wind turbine to determine which one was better. Um, over mi multiple days and multiple times, I did during the during around the morning, night, and around noon to see 
how, which one made the most, Sun Energy was more convenient because solar energy was more convenient. It had more conveniency and could be moved around more and it didn't have to be wired such as much as the wind, as wind turbines would have to. This way, solar energy can help save econom economics by helping without having to pay as many bills. And without all those billings, we wouldn't have to pay as many fees uh, in Florida, making a lot more, saving more money from the, based on taxes. I'm Catherine from Treasure Coast High. I'm Kenzie from Treasure Coast High. Okay. And um, our project is Witness Accuracy. And what we did was we did two trials where um, she dressed really crazy and entered a classroom and she was throwing stuff, um, screaming, making a disturbance. And then I came in for another class period, not the same class, a different group of people and just was very subtle and would see if they would notice anything. And then with both groups, what we did was we separated them into individual and group witnesses. And we found out that people for the calm trial were very noticing things that the individuals did not because they were working together and a lot of people were not paying attention. But for trial one, her crazy trial, a lot of people noticed because if someone busts in your classroom, you're gonna notice. And then, <laughs> and for our main topic was collusion and we wanted to see if that actually was a big, a big factor, which is collusion is something in criminal justice where if you keep witnesses together, they're gonna form their own version of the events. And in this, we want to see if that was true, and for a trial two, that did appear to be true. And so keeping them separated seems like the more accurate way to receive testimonies from witnesses. My name is Zoe Casillas. I go to the Marine Oceanographic Academy, attached to Fort Pierce Westwood High School. Um, I'm a senior, 12th grade. And this project is actually a continuation of a project I did last year and presented here as well. Um, I, last year, presented um, temperature's impact on viscosity and surface tension. And the sum of my results were that um, as temperature rose, viscosity increased, so it was less resistant to flow, and surface tension decreased, so the water broke more easily. Um, I decided to take a similar physical property capillary action and test its effect, on, its impact under the influence of temperature. Um, just to really tie it together, make it relevant, I like to play with temperature and physics is fun. Um, so what I did, I got three petri dishes, filled them with water, put them in the freezer for different amounts of time to get different ranges of temperature. Then I put one um, on the counter, room temperature, that was my control. And then the remaining water was put into an electric kettle and heated for different amounts of time so that I can get two higher extremes. Um, under testing, I, my results showed that as the temperature got higher, the time to flow decreased. So the, the speed of the capillary action occurring was higher. Um, I didn't originally think about it this way when I first did my project, but seeing as global climate change is a very you know, highly discussed topic in the media currently, the scientific theory of what's eventually going to happen is we're going to go into another ice age. So the planet's going to gradually get colder and colder and colder. But most people are only focusing on the hotter temperatures, but there's going to be very cold extremes. Um, and under these cold conditions, plant, plants cannot take those nutrients up through their roots through capillary action as the water carries them. So people aren't just gonna go outside and see a bunch of snow one day. The world's not gonna die. The plants aren't gonna go away because the ground's covered in snow. They're gonna go away because they can't get those nutrients up their stems. Um, and that's very interesting to think about. It's just another implication of climate change and what we need to be aware of. Um, so once I tied that back into my project from last year, you can see that as viscosity increases, um, capillary action increases, and as capillary action increases, surface tension decreases. So it's just connecting all of these physical properties, and that's something I always liked about physics. Everything's connected. <laughs>
My experience has been phenomenal. I've come across so many amazing ideas. You literally have students that really are tying their science project to reality, to, for example, the marine oceanographic, another example, the algae outbreak that we have in our area. And we have students that were impacted personally, so they've taken their projects personally and have expanded, but the competition is very, very tough. I mean, we have tremendous scientists and future engineers of America right here in St. Lucie County. My name is Jamie Rosenberg and I go to Northport K8 and my project is about fabric flammability. My question was, what kind of clothing material is most flammable? I tested wool, cotton, silk, and polyester and my hypothesis was that the thin fabrics will burn faster because of how their threads are weaved together. The threads are looser, allowing more oxygen to flow through, keeping the fire burning. If the if fire was set to four different fabric, fabric materials, then the silk should burn faster due to its loose threads. I cut the, I cut the material into one by one inch square pieces, and then I held it over a grill and lit it on fire. My results were, as predicted by the hypothesis, the looser, thinner fabrics were more flammable compared to the tighter knit fabrics. The silk burn faster than the other tested materials. So my name is Michael Gentry, and I'm from Lincoln Park Academy. My project was on soil erosion, and my, um, like my hypothesis was that if on um, soil that has many plants that can live in difficult weather conditions and have strong roots, then the soil would have the least amount of erosion to it. And my conclusion was that um, my hypothesis was correct and that um, a two-bag marigold um, didn't have any soil erosion to it. My name is Emma Farr and I go to El Lincoln Park Academy. So my project I did on does temperature affect the rate of metamorphosis of a darkling beetle. So last year I did a project on does light affect the rate of metamorphosis and it affected it but not as much as I thought it would. So this year I took it further into detail about does temperature and so these worms are normally found in dark damp places which you would think are cooler places but when I tested this the higher temperature of the mealworms that or the mealworms that were in the higher temperature changed faster because their metabolism was moving faster so their cells were moving faster which caused them to more rapidly change their metamorphosis. My name is Connor Stottlemyre and I go to Palm Point Educational Research School. And what I decided to do for my project is um, see which temperature would affect magnetic strength. So what I did was I put it in boiling water and what I noticed is, is that it caused the magnetic strength to go down. And if I put it in dry ice, it would cause it to go up. And the reason why that happens is because when the atoms inside the magnet, when they're cold, they'll come together and they'll make it stronger. And when they're hot, they'll go apart and make it weaker. So my result was that when it's colder, it will, basically make it stronger so like say your magnets aren't working or something you put it in the freeze or something and they'll work. Hi my name is Jordan Knapp. I'm a senior at Treasure Coast High School and this is my project. So what I did was I was working with fecal coliform in the St. Lucie Rivers and I teamed up with an organization down on Fort Pierce named Orca. I've been with them since seventh grade and we were trying to find out how the releases of the Okeechobee River cause toxicity in the water. And with this project, I learned that it was going to take quite some time. So I realized that I, what I had to do was find quick snapshots of what I wanted to research. So that's when I picked out pellet mass and pH to figure out how this is all going to correlate. 
However, you know, the pellet mass did not correlate with my fecal coliforms, but this is because of weather weathering issues. During the week-long process that we did, we had boats, storms come, so it kind of skewed our data. However, for the pH, it actually did have a direct correlation with the fecal coliform, but not to what I thought. My hypothesis was I thought it was going to decrease, but it actually increased in toxicity. So and this is because of the anaerobic respiration in the water. Since it does not produce oxygen, it produces lactic acids, which cause the fecal coliform to grow. And that is my project. My name is Victoria Dorvalis, and I go to Okame K-8. And my project was on how temperature affects the rate of diffusion. And basically, I got hot or cold water, and I put food coloring in it to see how fast it would, how fast the food coloring would spread and I hypothesized that hot water would make the, the food coloring diffuse the fastest. And this would basically help anybody that like, that like chemists who like to mix chemicals together on what temperature of water they should use in order for the temperature to spread the fastest. And on, in my conclusion, I ended up with how, I ended up with hot water diffusing the food, color, the food coloring the fastest. My name is Wes Maristellis and I was, and I'm in Samuel Gaines Academy, and I've been doing a project about ants. So my project was about the type of food that ants prefer the most, but I just put it into three categories, sugar, salt, and syrup. So then I was taking a look to see the amount of food that was left so that means that that's the amount of food that they ate the most. So then, after I did my, I had my hypothesis to see that I thought it was they were going to eat salt more, but it turns out they like they preferred syrup because the amount of salt that was left inside of the cup was greater. So that means they didn't like it that much because they didn't eat that much of salt. But then it seems that the syrup was the least, so that means that they liked the syrup more, and they ate more of the syrup. And then that was my conclusion. And the, peop the people who, sh who should like be using this information would be exterminators to attract the um, ants or people who have an ant problem and want to get rid of them. So they could attract the ants by having syrup around on a cup, and then when the ants come to the syrup they could just put it put the um ants outside or in the trash or get rid of the ants so that was why i did this project to help other people who have an ant problem i'm alexa vega i'm in seventh grade and go to lincoln park academy and i wanted to measure the amount of electrolytes in sports drinks um i'm very active so i thought this would be a really good project for me so my results I found out that body armor has the most electrolytes and it's best to stay hydrated. Um, I thought that Gatorade would have the most, but it actually had the least amount of electrolytes. And oh, um, so I had to get this kit and then I had to hold it in the liquid for about like five seconds. And then after we took down the number, we had to divide it by nine to figure out the actual conduct the conductance of electrolytes and then we did that with every drink so my hypothesis was wrong and next time when I do this again I probably do different drinks and see which one would benefit the most I'm really or from North Cork K-8 my uh, science fair project was on how high hel sir, a helicopter can fly, and the one I modeled, and I used a quad, a little quadcopter about this big. The, I modeled it. I used it to model a Robinson R22 Beta 2, which it it's a fairly low altitude helicopter, as but they're but they're commonly used for training pilots. Uh, my hypothesis was that they would not be able to fly over 610 meters, but I was proven wrong when it was able to fly consistently at 1,513 1, meters.
the way I was testing it is I had a vacuum chamber and I was modeling the atmosphere by changing the air pressure and having the drone have to fly above the, this line for f three seconds straight. I this is where it, this would connect to the pump, but and I have my pump. And that that's the gauges and stuff like that. So. In, in my research, I did find a formula because, like, the way I made it to where it would be as similar as possible is by using a power to weight ratio to put them together to, to have them equal in that. So I got the quadcopter, the little quadcopter, and had it and found a helicopter that had the same power to weight ratio. I would have done a lift, uh, a lift to weight ratio. But I did not have I did I did not have, quite have the time and the means to get the to, to get to get the to find all the information to do the the lift the lift formula for the quadcopter and and the helicopter. But like I said, I was proven wrong when it flew. It flew it flew to 1,513 meters, which is equivalent to about 5,000 feet which is fairly high for the Robinson RC2 Beta. It's generally as highest as about 3,000, 4,000. Uh, my name is Yanin Lin. I'm from LPA. And my project was the application of alkali and tea on reducing carbon dioxide levels caused by global warming. So after the Industrial Revolution, car carbon dioxide levels have been steadily increasing over the years, right? It went from 280 ppm to about 404 parts per million as of January. That's an average. And after... Hey, at least it's early. And right. after the human population has increased, also partially due to introduction of food crops from Americas and the and it's happened around the industrial revolution food waste has also become a problem so my project was to use a tea which is also a food waste to uh, help reduce carbon dioxide levels and I hypothesized that tea would be able to absorb carbon dioxide because it's alkaline and porous and because it can absorb carbon dioxide it will be expedited by the addition of sodium hydroxide which is alkaline since alkalis will react with uh, carbon dioxide to, to form bicarbonate. So my pro project had five control groups, and which was 20 milliliters of water, 20 milliliters of sodium hydroxide, 3 grams of tea, 20 milliliters of water plus uh, 3 grams of tea, and 20 milliliters of sodium hydroxide plus tea. And I, in I sealed them in plastic vacuum bags and I injected 18 milliliters of 2.5% concentration carbon dioxide into each bag and after one hour I extracted 5 milliliters of carbon dioxide from each bag and uh, measured them in the CO2 analyzer and then after 24 hours I repeated the process. And after that, I used uh, SAS 9.4 to analyze my results and the, using the Duncan's multiple tests where uh, the p-value is a 0.05. So if the p-values are less than 0.05, that means that the values are statistically significant. So if they have different letters, that means that their difference is statistically significant. And if they have the same letter, that means their value is not statistically significantly different, which is it's kind of a uh, mouthful. So it was shown that after through three trials that after 24 hours, T was able to absorb 96% of carbon dioxide and that adding sodium hydroxide allowed it to absorb uh, all 100% after one hour, which was the same uh, rate as a sodium hydroxide. So my hypothesis was proven correct. more so than the students. I know this is the students, it's their time to shine, but it's also a reminder of all the wonderful things happening in our in our district and our students are hard at work 
um, press, pushing and pressing themselves to think beyond just the classroom walls and be creative and think outside the box. So their rationale for why they're doing the project is so interesting to me as to what made you create this or think of this or go in that direction. It's a great, it's a, it's a beautiful opportunity to see the students shine. And just another thing to kind of add to it is you wish there was an opportunity for everyone in the community to come and be a part of this to see what these kids have accomplished and the level of standards of excellence that um, are happening here in St. Lucie County. It's just a, it's a great opportunity for us to showcase our students, but you wish it wasn't on such a small um, scale. scale, yeah, that you, they really had the opportunity to really showcase this beyond these walls because you would be blown away by what these kids have accomplished. We sent 14 students to the state competition, and we sent two senior students to international in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The state competition is the last week of March in, at Lakeland, Florida, where 14 students get to compete against all the students in the state of Florida. Historically, an overwhelming majority of students that we have sent to the state competition walk across the street, walk across the stage, and receive recognition. My name is Beatrice Renee, and I'm from Okemet K-8, and my project is on, on what makes ice melt faster, ranging from salt, sand, and sugar. When I, when I hypothesize that salt will be the solute to melt the, fast, the fastest because it's made of sodium chloride and iodine and when it's, when it's applied to ice, the melting point lowers. I conducted three trials and I used millimeters to collect how much water was melted and salt was the solvent that melted the ice the fastest. Um, so my hypothesis was proven correct in my conclusion. So my name is Farzine Chigani and I go to Lincoln Park Academy. And this project is about what type of lights moths are the most and least attracted to. Because as many people know, moths do swarm around our outdoor lights. Now, I took that basis and in this project, I tried to analyze what type of light moths love the most, basically, and which lights they did not like being near. So during this experiment, I saw that moths had a tendency to go toward LED lights, and that actually turned out to be the most popular light source. Halogen came in in a close second. Halogen lights are nearly as bright as LED lights, but unfortunately they did not do as well. And candles were, they are not a popular light source contrary to belief. The, the saying, like a moth to a flame, well, you could just forget about that. Hence the title, like a moth to a bull. Now, whenever you see a moth, it's always near light, right? But they're usually supposed to navigate with the light of the moon. Unfortunately, because of more urbanization around places like this where moths live, they're more attracted to well-lit areas like cities. They're not able to pollinate plants that they are supposed to pollinate, and their predators are now moving toward urban areas. This has a big effect on the ecosystem, unfortunately. So this project is also trying to help out moths and people who see them as a pest of some sort. My name is Mariah and I go to St. Lucie West K-8. Um, I did my experiment on which type of slime is the most viscous, as you can see from the title. Clear slime was the least viscous as it took six minutes and six seconds as an average out of the three repetitions. And that was stated in my hypothesis, and it was correct. Also in my hypothesis, I thought that fluffy slime would be the most viscous, and that was proven correct because it was 68 minutes and nine seconds overall as an average. Um, 
I think the fluffy slime was the most viscous because of the borax solution added. There was more of that than there was in the clear slime. And because there were a lot of additives, such as um, shaving cream and lotion, um, we ended up first using a smaller funnel than this one, but the fluffy slime just wouldn't pass through, so we ended up having to do all the repetitions in this one instead. They passed through a little bit quicker just because the hole at the bottom is wider. Um, my hypothesis was correct, but I thought that um, butter slime was, I thought butter slime was going to be um, less viscous than foam slime, but it wasn't, it was more viscous. So, by doing this experiment, I found out that Newtonian fluids are fluids that only are only affected by temperature, and slime, I found out, is not a Newtonian fluid. It's a non-Newtonian fluid because it is also affected by pressure. Um, I also found out that um, viscosity is not related to density. Viscosity is thickness. And, yeah. Where did you get your slime? I made it at home with YouTube recipes. Okay, my name is Nigel Johnson, and I'm from Fort Pierce Central High School. Um, as you can see, my presentation, my project was regarding uh, environmental sleeping temperature and how it affects dream recollection. And based off of my research, I determined that when people sleep at a temperature that is higher than their ideal one, they're going to recall more dreams versus if they were to sleep at a temperature that is lower than their ideal temperature, they would recall less dreams. And in each one of my subjects who slept at two degrees above their ideal sleeping temperature, they were able to recall uh, at least one dream. As you can see in the data, they were all one dream, uh, two dreams, one dream, two dreams. One of the participants even recalled three dreams that night from sleeping at a higher temperature versus somebody who slept at a uh, lower temperature, which is two degrees below. Some of them recalled one dream or absolutely no dreams. In the analysis, people who slept at a higher temperature recall, on average, a 403% increase in dreaming activity versus their ideal sleeping temperature, and that's about 33% of dreams recalled. And that's very significant because we all know somebody who says that I don't dream or I can't remember my dreams when in fact we all dream about four to six times per night. And it's just that 99% of those dreams are forgotten. So to have somebody recall 33% of their dreams, about one third at two degrees above their sleeping temperature, I found to be very interesting versus somebody who slept two degrees below their sleeping temperature could only recall 6.6% .6 of those dreams. So I found that the correlation between temperature and dream recollection was very interesting and worth researching. My name is Michael Skinner. I'm presenting for Southern Oaks Middle School. And for my project, I uh, try to see um, which liquid does stain teeth the darkest. And for the teeth, I, instead of using actual teeth, I used eggs because they're the best representation of teeth. And for my procedures, I use like eggs, plastic cups, and like the same brands of cola, uh, tea, and coffee. And um, this was a very like long process because I had to wait one hour, then six hours, and twelve hours to find my results. And for my conclusion, I found out that tea stains teeth the darkest because the tannins in teeth actually can stain teeth. It's not actually the tannins that stain teeth. It's the tannins that make the teeth get stained because of the dark liquids. And then, and then teeth stains happen when the enamel of the tooth becomes discolored. And then there can be, and then the tannins actually can be found in coffee and tea. That's really it. <laughs>
My name is Elise Starr. I go to Fort Pierce Central High School. So my project basically was about a public health survey and surveying kids, students through 9th and 12th grade and wondering if they knew anything about uh, the disease hepatitis C and also if they knew about what um, the effects are of their phone placement during sleeping hours and what the effects are if they use their phone right before they go to sleep. And so there's a law called Planck's Law that emits radiation at all times and um, the amount of radiation coming from the phone is harmful to your body in such a way because you're trying to get sleep and your your body isn't shutting down, your brain isn't shutting down because of the radiation coming in contact with your brain at the time. And then I also asked three questions to these students, um, wondering if they knew anything about the disease hepatitis C, which attacks the liver and is transmitted through blood. And I asked them how it could be transmitted, if it could be transmitted through uh, needles or piercings, and um, if it could be, if it could lead to cancer. And so all of those are yes, it could be, it could lead to cancer, and it could be transmitted through tattoos and piercings. And I figured out through my conclusions, I figured out that nobody really knew anything about these diseases, which is eye-opening because it's something prevalent in this world. World. And um, I figured out that less than 50%, only 20% of students knew exactly what hepatitis C was. And that's just with their answers. They might have guessed, they might have actually known it. We don't really know yet. So it's just kind of prevalent that the older you got, the less you knew basically about the disease, which is a little off, like a little um, opposite of what somebody else would think. And so I basically came up with that only 9.20% of 12th, uh, 12th, 12th graders actually knew what the disease was and how it could be transmitted. I'm Summer Miles and I am here for Palm Point and I did a artificial pancreas and tested how it would work just like a real pump that I wear myself. See if it could regulate high blood sugars. So what I did was I made the pump as you can see here and then I made a solution of just water and baking soda representing high blood glucose levels. And then I did one with just vinegar. And when I started the pump, it was pumping the vinegar into the baking soda solution. And it actually turns out that it ended up regulating it and like, like just dissolving the baking soda which would represent insulin going into the body and destroying high blood glucose levels. So, many people choose to wear a pump, but a lot of people just don't, un don't understand how it works. And I feel like doing this project will help people understand kind of what the pump does and how great it is.